Now that we've talked about what PetCT is and how to optimize the protocols, let's talk a little bit about when PetCT should be used in head and neck oncology and when it shouldn't be used. First, let's talk very generally about oncologic imaging. There are several patient scenarios where it is particularly useful. When we are staging a newly discovered tumor to determine how far it has spread through the body, when we are planning a treatment, usually a radiation oncology treatment plan, when we are monitoring the response to a particular treatment to see whether we need to switch horses midstream or whether it is working, and in surveillance. Surveillance is when we believe we've cured the tumor, but we want to keep an eye out and catch recurrences early. And then, of course, there is restaging of recurrent disease, which is really a form of tumor staging. PET-CT is very useful in the staging of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. It is particularly useful in the evaluation of advanced tumors. What do I mean by advanced tumors? I mean tumors that are T3 in size or have spread to lymph nodes, M1, or have spread distantly, hematogenously, that is M1. Sometimes a T2 lesion is worthy of evaluation depending on how aggressive it is and whether it has invaded key structures. In other words, we use PET-CT when distant disease is likely. If distant disease is unlikely, we can just use an MRI or a CT, but if we want to use PET-CT, we're using it to screen the whole body. Let's take a particular scenario for staging, the unknown primary. What's an unknown primary? An unknown primary is when we detect squamous cell carcinoma in a lymph node of the neck. We know that squamous cell carcinoma doesn't arise de novo in lymph nodes. It has to come from somewhere. It comes from a mucosal or cutaneous surface. So if you have a situation like this where there is a definite metastatic node, we know that this is squamous cell carcinoma, but uh, you've been staring at this picture now for the better part of a minute, and if you can find the primary tumor on this image, you're a better radiologist than I am. There it is on the PET. You can see the base of tongue lighting up here on this fused image. That's the primary tumor in the base of tongue, of course, path proven. I don't think there's any way to find it on the CT. It's just too superficial. So um, PET-CT is particularly useful in the setting of an unknown primary tumor. It detects another 25% of unknown primary tumors above and beyond a standard CT, clinical evaluation, and panendoscopy. Here's another staging scenario, the N0 neck. When there is no evidence of nodal metastasis on clinical examination and on radiologic CT of the neck, does PET-CT help us by finding unsuspected nodal disease? The answer is no. Several studies have confirmed that in an N0 neck, PET-CT really doesn't add much. Here's another special staging scenario. Uh, we know that patients who have squamous cell carcinoma of the upper aerodigestive tract, including the lungs and, and head and neck cancers, frequently end up with second primary because they have field cancerization. All of their mucosal surfaces are exposed to whatever carcinogens uh, uh, they are exposed to. Um, CT can do a very good job of distinguishing metastatic disease from a new primary tumor, which can be very difficult. Uh, here is a PET-CT. There's a mass in the lung. It's FDG avid. Could be a MET. Could be a second primary. When we get a high-resolution CT, we can see how irregular the borders are. That looks a lot more like a primary tumor. This, in fact, was a new primary adenocarcinoma of the lung. Sometimes it's really difficult, but sometimes you can make a pretty strong guess. Patients who are being restaged for recurrent squamous cell carcinoma are at an especially high risk of having second primary tumors, so always be on the lookout for additional primary disease in these patients. Here's an example showing how PET-CT can be useful in treatment planning for radiation oncology. Uh, here we have this vague area 
of residual disease versus scar tissue all through the right side of the upper neck, superhyoid neck here. Very hard to tell where the tumor is and what's just scarred in treated disease. Let me overlay a pet for you. Well, now it's a lot easier, right? Now you can definitively see which part of this mass houses viable tumor. Here's a special monitoring scenario, the planned neck dissection. It used to be that anytime someone had large bulky adenopathy and they were treated definitively with chemoradiation, a planned neck dissection at 12 weeks was always performed because there was such a high risk of incomplete clearance of disease out of those huge nodes. Now we knew that half of those patients were being operated on unnecessarily because we had effectively cured their nodal disease, but we didn't know which half. So we did routine planned neck dissection. Can PET-CT help to identify that 50% of patients who don't need a neck dissection? Yes, it can. If you do a follow-up PET-CT um, three months after the conclusion of chemoradiation and the entire nodal cluster has no FDG avidity, you can confidently say that that patient no longer has viable disease in the neck, and that patient can defer the planned neck dissection. They don't need a neck dissection after all. Now we don't count, all, we don't catch all of the patients who uh, who don't have viable disease in their neck, but we catch uh, about half of them, and that, that's pretty. That's really worth doing the PET CT to avoid a planned neck dissection in the setting of bulky adenopathy. So when do we not get a PET-CT? When is PET-CT wasteful? This is an expensive examination and insurers are already very reluctant to pay for this. So we don't want to be wasteful about utilization of PET-CT. If there is no proven cancer, then you shouldn't be getting a PET-CT. If you have a neck mass and maybe it's, it look, kind of looks like cancer, wait until you have the FNA, wait until you've proven that it's cancer before getting a PET-CT. Small tumors, and I'm really talking about T1 tumors here, don't have a, a strong likelihood of having spread to nodes or, or, or hematogenously distant disease, and so they probably don't deserve a PET-CT. T2 tumors, like we talked about earlier, are a little more controversial. It depends on the tumor itself, um, but T1 tumors really don't deserve PET-CT. Wasteful. Don't get a PET-CT too soon after therapy. Don't get a PET-CT right after surgery or right after chemoradiation because you'll get false positives. The body is still healing from the surgery or the radiation um, and there will be false positive uptake within the tumor bed. Even if you go on to do a dissection at that point, you may get a false positive histopathology because dying tumor that is destined to go away, dying tumor looks like live tumor, and it's difficult for the pathologist to distinguish those. Be wary of non-FDG avid tumors, and I'm talking about glandular tumors here, like some forms of thyroid cancer and uh, salivary cancers. These are frequently non-FDG avid tumors. If they are de-differentiated, they probably are FDG avid, but if they're well-differentiated tumors, um, PET-CT is not going to find them for you and may give you a false sense of security when it comes up negative. Cystic neck masses are really tricky. If you are trying to evaluate a cystic neck mass to determine whether it represents benign or malignant disease, don't use PET-CT for that. You're better off resecting it. PET-CT is extremely misleading when it comes to purely cystic neck masses. A metastatic disease can have so little uh, uh, viable t tissue in the periphery that it doesn't show up on PET, and you can have inflammatory stuff around benign cysts that, that makes, makes them false positives. It's just misleading. Wait until you know whether you're dealing with cancer or not. Here's an example of a situation where a glandular uh, tumor is misleading. This is medullary thyroid cancer. I submit to you that there is just nothing to see on these axial 
pet images. There's no increased uptake beyond the underlying physiologic uptake. But on the CT, you can clearly see there's nodal disease, and this is path proven medullary thyroid carcinoma. We know that there are much better uh, uh, pet radio tracers now. Dotatate is great for this, but the FDG is not going to cut it. Ironically, benign diseases of the salivary glands often have increased FDG avidity. And so you get false positives from benign disease, you get false negatives from malignant disease, you kind of can't win in the setting of salivary tumors. This happens to be a benign oncocytoma of the parotid gland. These frequently have a lot of FDG avidity. Um, Worthen's tumors, also a lot of FDG avidity. Um, uh, it can be very misleading. Let's talk for a moment specifically about PET-CT in the setting of thyroid carcinoma. It's useful in a very narrow scenario. First of all, you have to be dealing with differentiated thyroid carcinoma, by which I mean follicular or papillary thyroid carcinomas. It has to have been treated with a total thyroidectomy and radioiodine. There must be elevated thyroglobulin in the patient's blood, and there has to be a negative radioiodine scan. If all of those criteria are met, then PET-CT is justified because you know, based on the elevated thyroglobulin, that there is tumor in there somewhere. You're just not seeing it. A negative radioiodine scan tells us that the tumor itself has begun to de-differentiate. A well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma of papillary or follicular type, a well-differentiated version, will continue to take up iodine. But as the tumor de-differentiates, it will lose its iodine avidity and gain instead FDG avidity. So only once we know that it has lost some of its differentiation by not showing up on a radioiodine scan is it worth getting the much more expensive PET-CT. Don't jump to PET-CT and thyroid carcinoma. It's useful in a very narrow circumstance. PET-CT for lymphoma and melanoma arising in the head and neck, it's good. This is super easy. PET-CT is clearly beneficial for staging, monitoring, and surveillance of lymphoma and melanoma in the head and neck. End of story. Let me take a moment to talk about standardized uptake values. Standardized uptake values are very useful in some forms of cancer, lymphoma being a, a good example of that. But in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, SUV is often misleading, and so we don't rely on it. Uh, SUV values are heavily dependent on the specific machine being used and on specific patient characteristics, so it may be comparable if you are scanning the same patient on the same machine. Um, and we do know that uh, an SUV of greater than nine, SUV max of greater than nine on a staging examination carries a poor prognosis, but you probably didn't need the SUV to tell you that when the tumors are th that large and aggressive. So generally, standardized uptake values are not useful for squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck, and the subjective opinion of an experienced uh, uh, interpreter is more compelling. So now let's move on to surveillance imaging. What is surveillance? Surveillance is imaging that occurs when a patient has already been definitively treated for their cancer. We're not halfway through treatment. We're not in a palliative setting. They have been definitively treated for their cancer and we believe based on clinical evaluation that we have cured the cancer. There is no clinical evidence of disease. So why are we doing it? The goal is to start treatment of recurrence earlier. We don't want to wait until the recurrence is evident clinically. Using imaging, we can detect that recurrence earlier than it is evident clinically, and we can begin whatever salvage is available to us earlier. And we'd like to believe, hasn't been proven, we'd like to believe that that improves patients' likelihood of survival uh, when we treat their recurrent disease. Now, there's a whole other lecture on this YouTube channel about uh, surveillance of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and the rise of NIRADS, which I recommend to you uh, to extend this part of the discussion. That concludes our discussion on uses and abuses of PET-CT. In the next lecture, we will talk about how to read the PET-CTs, false positives, and false negatives.